Hello, and welcome to Socratic Studios. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjum Sangari, and this episode's topic will be a recent discovery about using neuroprosthesis to allow paralyzed people to communicate with others in full sentences by converting brainwaves and signals into words. This discovery will greatly improve the quality of life of people suffering from paralysis, as well as gaining a deeper understanding of how to communicate with the brain. With me today, I have Dr. David Moses, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, San Francisco, and one of the main authors of the study detailing his team's discovery. Welcome, Dr. Moses. Thank you so much for appearing on the podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Thanks, Anjum. I appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so to begin our podcast with, I'd like to ask a little bit about the background science that is involved with your research. So could you give a little basic explanation of how paralysis affects the brain and to what extent the brain is still able to function in a paralyzed individual as it relates to your studies? Sure, yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, I think there are different kinds of conditions that can cause different kinds of paralysis. For us in this, you know, as part of this clinical trial that the work that was recently published arose from, we are interested primarily in people who have severe paralysis and a condition called anarthria, which is loss of the ability to articulate, you know, words and speech in general. And so these people, the reason why we want to try and work with people with this these conditions is because they typically have limited forms of communication still available to them. You know, they can't speak, they can't move their hands and their arms to type, um, to communicate. So really there's, there's just extremely limited, like commercially available assistive communication systems. And so our goal, you know, our long-term goal for the, for this line of research is to develop we refer to as a speech neuroprosthesis. And what this is, is it's a brain computer interface that allows, that restores speech as a mode of communication to someone purely driven by their volition and their brain activity. So through this interface, you know, a system decodes what they want to say, what they're trying to say, but are unable to because of paralysis, it decodes that into the speech which is either in text form or kind of a speech waveform. Um, in terms of the actual effects we see on the brain, so right now we, the technology that we use is this interface called electrocorticography or ECOG for short. And what this is, is a sheet of electrodes laid on the cortical surface. And right now in our first participant, we have it laid over the speech sensory motor cortex. And what that is, is it's the part of the brain that normally controls the vocal tract. So your lips, your tongue, your larynx, it, you know, it's a really complex system of articulators that we control kind of effortlessly to give rise to speech. And the brain area that, you know, orchestrates all those movements, that's the one we're interested in. Um, and so it's important for us that the cortex of the person we're working with. So that's the outer surface of the brain, basically, um, where a lot of high level processing happens. That brain area should still be intact, at least the part related to speech. So that's why, um, again, there are different forms of paralysis and different forms of like trauma and other disorders that can cause paralysis. But we are mainly interested in, you know, right now the technology the assumption is that the technology requires someone with an intact speech motor cortex so that um, the signals that would normally control the vocal tract, we are trying to tap into those to enable our, our device. And people with paralysis normally have uh, intact and usable um, part of that brain? That you I don't use? know the, right, I don't know the full statistics, but for example, if you get a spinal cord injury um, that you know obviously happens lower than the brain, but it can still affect your ability to speak and your ability to move, of course. And so, for participants with that condition, or for 
people with that condition, um, we think that a technology like this could be very useful. There's also um, ALS, which stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but um, I think it's sometimes referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease. But that's when you, it's kind of a motor neuron degeneration. So you eventually, you, it, it's a, eventually you lose the ability to move most of your voluntary, like skeletal muscles. And in many cases, the, the part of, you know, the cortex, the part of the brain that, that we're interested in, the speech motor cortex, it seems like you know, this hasn't, um, it seems very likely that those parts of the brain are still intact. And so that's another type of person that, that might benefit from this technology. Um, the participant that we have currently had a brainstem stroke. So that you know, affects the brainstem, which is, again, is not the, the area of the cortex, the area of the brain that we're, that we're trying to tap into. So for all of these types of conditions, you know, I think that this technology is, it, it can be applicable. Right. And so in your study and uh, in this past question, you explained that you use um, something called neuroprosthesis. Uh, could you maybe explain a little bit more about what exactly neuroprosthesis is in relation to your work or explain its process and function? Yeah. So. You can think of when most people think of a, a prosthesis, they think of like a, a leg or an arm, you know, like a prosthetic limb, for example. So that is just a, a mechanical, physical item that can be really, really helpful in restoring mobility or um, dexterity or things like that. And some of those are actually getting advanced to the point where they can interact with your neural signature. So perhaps through um, nerve endings in your muscle fibers uh, to help control the, the prosthesis. But what we're talking about, when we say a neuroprosthesis, it means that it's a, it's a device that is directly controlled by brain activity. So that's, that's what we mean. And when we say speech neuroprosthesis, we mean a device that's directly controlled by neural activity with, you know, with the goal of restoring speech. Right. And you also mentioned that you use a technology called ECOG. Um, could you explain how that relates to uh, what you're doing, like how you use it? Yeah. So to give a little bit of background on, on ECOG, it is currently used today in, in medical treatments for epilepsy. So what, what is, used for in that scenario is there are some people who have epilepsy and they don't respond well to medicine. So they have what's, you know, kind of referred to as intractable epilepsy. And so for these individuals, um, brain surgery is an option for treatment. And what happens is they go to the hospital and they get brain surgery. And during that surgery, a an ECOG array is laid over the surface of their brain. And so what this is, is imagine like a flexible sheet, but it has little sensors, electrodes that sit on the surface of the brain. And then the, uh, the head is sewn shut. And then the, now there's just these implanted sensors sitting on the surface of the brain. And then the person will wait in the hospital until a seizure happens. Hopefully that's the goal a seizure happens, the sensors will pick up and monitor the, the origin of the seizure and you know, understand how it propagates and understand all the characteristics they can about the seizure. And then they use that to inform a second surgery in which the seizure focus or foci um, get removed from the brain. So this technology has been really helpful in identifying seizure locations. But it turns out it's also a really great, you know, neuroimaging technology to understand speech processing in the brain and actually many other kinds of processing. There's many studies now that are using 
ECOG, for example, for you know arm motor studies um, and and others. But for us, we use it to record from this kind of speech area of the cortex. And this is, in terms of how we got to this point, for the past decade, we've been really doing speech research with these epilepsy patients. Many of them volunteer while they're in the hospital waiting as part of their treatment. They volunteer to participate in speech studies. And so we have them listen to sentences, for example, or speak sentences, and we try to relate brain activity to the speech that they're hearing or saying and to try to understand how the brain processes speech. And it's we've gained a lot of insight into kind of the neural processing mechanisms. And some of those have really helped us in this current clinical trial to, um, to decode speech from this anarthric person. So does using ECOG, like uh, putting the array on someone's brain like that, does that have any side effects or irritants or anything like that for the patient? Or is it relatively uh, non-invasive? So it is definitely invasive because it is brain surgery, but in the sense of like actually bothering the, the person, I think it's, so one advantage of ECOG compared to some other recording modalities that it doesn't actually penetrate into the brain. So there's less chance for like brain scarring or for like, like tissue to develop over the, like encapsulate the sensors. Um, so I think it is not as invasive as possible because probably like in injecting into the brain would be even more invasive. But so, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't think that there have been many long-term side effects. There aren't that many long-term ECOG studies. There are some, and I'm not aware of any side effects that people have reported in terms of like causing pain or irritant or like irritation that they can actually feel. You know, the brain doesn't have kind of these like feelings. Like you can't, there aren't these receptors like pain receptors or something in your brain um, as far as I know. And so, yeah, I don't think that that's really an issue. And then in terms of actual risk of, of scarring, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fairly low. I haven't heard of any cases of that for like a long-term implant with ECOG. And uh, after the surgery is completed, is there like a, uh, a second brain surgery to take it out or does it uh, dissolve or what happens to it inside the brain? It needs to be taken out. Yeah, sure. It's, it's pretty, um, the electrodes are, you know, metal. So they'll, and the plastic is, it's non biodegradable as far as I know. So yeah, it definitely will need to be taken out, uh, at the end of the study for us in our clinical trial, we get, um, we're approved to work with up to five years for a single participant. So it's definitely long term, and in the study itself that that we have, you know, we re report data recorded over eighty one weeks. So that's you know over a year and a half. Um, and the participant, I mean, we still work with them to this day. You know, we're still working with him. So that's been over two years that he's had this device. Right. And so you mentioned that um, you're working with only one patient using this technology so far. Is there anything specific? And you don't have to get into too much detail. But like, is there anything specific or interesting about this patient's situation that caused you guys to choose him or her? Right. So this participant who, there's really a, a great story written up about, about him and his involvement in the project in the New York Times. Um, it he's you know his journey is truly remarkable he is an incredibly amazing person and he's very determined dedicated and uh it's it's just an absolute pleasure to work with him um in terms of the actual like scientific reasons for why 
we work with him, it's because one of the reasons is because he is, he does have a stable condition in the sense that he had a brainstem stroke. And ever since that, I mean, his condition is mostly stable. Um, he's very cognitively intact. He's very sharp. Um, and his paralysis and his anarthria, you know, we just felt that he would be a really good fit for the, the start of the trial. You know, I, I wasn't involved myself directly in the recruitment process, but I definitely am thankful for everyone involved in that process because I think he was really, you know, top, top of the line uh, person to work with. You know, he's a great collaborator in this project. Right. And so now getting a little bit more into detail on, you know, how exactly it sort of translates words and into comprehensible sentences and things like that. Could you maybe explain how you were able to use uh, neuroprosthesis and ECOG and those technologies um, to have people who suffer from paralysis be able to communicate with each other? Yeah, so in this particular, you know, in this kind of speech neuroprosthesis that we're interested in building and that we have this kind of a, a feasibility demonstration for in this paper, the general pipeline is that we have the sensors, it's 128 channels that are sitting on the surface of his brain. And so those signals are being acquired by the, you know, his brain activity is being acquired by the sensors. And that, you know, the electrical activity is kind of sent through a connection. So basically um, there's this kind of feed through that's implanted in his skull that conducts the, electrical signals to the outside of his skull. And we have a, a, a link basically that we connect to the, this feed through. And so when we get there, we connect. And then now the signals can go through this link and to our machines. And so our computers then are processing the signals. And then what's, you know, we have a separate process for actually training these these neural network models that we use, but kind of to just talk about how they're used in the end, um, we have a speech detection model that is analyzing the neural activity sample by sample, and it's trying to determine when he's attempting to speak. So as he, you know, it's just scanning every, every time point of neural data, and then it sees some pattern that it thinks is associated with an attempt to speak. And it takes, a small time window of activity, of, of brain activity associated with that attempt that it's detected and it passes that to a word classifier. And this is a separate neural network model that takes the brain activity and tries to predict how likely each of the 50 words were. So I should say this whole process is, is going on as he is trying to say a sentence. So we present a sentence on the screen, for example, and he's trying to repeat that sentence word by word. And so the vocabulary is 50 words. So there's only 50 words that, that we show um, decoding with at this point. And the word classifier is then saying, okay, given this brain activity that I just got from the speech detector, how likely are each of the 50 words as to be the word he was trying to say. And so it, now I have like a probability for each of the 50 words. It's like, how likely was he to be currently trying to say word one, word two, word three across all 50. And that information gets sent to kind of the, this final part of the model of the, the system, which is incorporating language modeling information. And so what I mean by language modeling information is that you know, in English, certain sequences of words are just more likely to occur than others. Um, you know, the sentence, how are you, is much more likely to occur than how glass is you, right? So that kind of information about sequences is 
is conveyed by this thing called a language model. And so now you have, and this type of technology is used, for example, if you were to speak into your phone um, and it converts this, that sound into text, there is some kind of language modeling being done there or in your word processor, when you're typing a document or even in an email, composing an email, you might get some suggested corrections based on the, the grammar, et cetera. But anyways, back to our system, now you have information from the neural models and information from the language model, and those are combined to eventually give rise to the sentence. That, and that's how we decode the sentence that he's trying to say. I see. And so you mentioned you only have, <clears throat> you mentioned you only have uh, 50 words in the database that you're using for this. So I wanted to ask, is it really difficult to like um, sort of code a word so that it's usable? In this, like, is there any kind of association that needs to happen, or what is the process for uh, creating another word that um, can be used in your interface? Yeah. So right now, one of the limitations is the vocabulary size, and that it's it's limited to fifty words. I mean, we did choose these words to meet a variety of constraints, and one of them is that they can be used to generate, you know, a good amount of you know sentences with different meanings so it's simply not terrible but obviously we want to eventually go beyond 50 words and so to actually train these the main part um, that would need to be modified in your suggestion would be the word classification model and so for this the way it's currently trained is that it sees samples of Okay, so the way it's currently trained is during a different task with the participant where he's just trying to, we show him one of the 50 words and he tries to say that word. And then we show him another word and he tries to say that word. And so these are done in isolation. So that's kind of this isolated words task. And then so at, as a result of this task, we have many, many, many examples of him trying to say each word and the neural activity associated with those words. And that is what the word classifier is, is learning from. So it's trying to detect subtle patterns in the brain activity to differentiate between the different words. And so to add a word, you would need to collect repeats of you know, many instances of him trying to say that word. That, that's how you would update the model in its current form. Now, ideally in the future, there are other options. So Something that we have shown with the epilepsy patient volunteers who have been able to speak naturally, do not have speech impairments. What we've been able to show is that you can actually model sub word components such as phones, phonemes. And so these are like speech sounds. So when I say the word Bob, the bus sound, for example, can be modeled. The O sound can be modeled or the ah sound, I should say. And then the ah sound in Bob is the same as the ah sound in Cobb, more or less. And so you can kind of use these similarities across. It, you can think of it as an alphabet for speech sounds. And you can actually model those, that alphabet, and use them to construct unseen words later. And what I mean by that is you could theoretically generate a word based on these like phony models that the person has never, that the model was not trained on. And so that's one way to expand the vocabulary. There's also other work that shows you can go straight to um, speech sounds. So that was kind of a, a really compelling finding from our group is that you can try to model the articulator movements themselves in a, in a normal, in a, someone with intact speech. And so by modeling the vocal tract directly, if you are able to understand how the brain is trying to control the vocal tract, then theoretically you could go from brain activity to vocal tract representation and then vocal tract representation to speech. And that's one other way you can get large vocabulary because if you're just modeling um, your vocal tract, you shouldn't be constrained to a limited vocabulary set. Um, so these are, these are just options moving forward where 
we are trying to explore some other options um, to expand the vocabulary, but these are just some ways of doing that. Right. And so when your ECOG array looks at um, or predicts the word that the person is saying, the, the paralyzed individual, does it look at the actual word itself that the person is thinking of, or does it associate it, does it have to associate it with like, um, like an image of what the person is thinking about? Like if, if the person is thinking of cat, like does it see actually the word cat like it, because does the person think of like an image of a cat and then it takes it from there or something? No, so yeah, this kind of raises a bigger, this points to like a, a bigger aspect, which is that I, I do, would, I would like to stress that this is, you know, it's not mind reading in any way that this is controlled by someone's attempts to speak. You know, it's, it's the person that has to be trying to say the word and the brain area that we're recorded from is normally involved in control of the vocal tract. So we think that this is definitely, it's very, um, it's very much on the level of speech motor command and speech motor function and not on abstract concepts such as like the image of the word or something like that. So we think it is definitely tied to the person's attempts to speak and it's tied to the speech itself and not any other abstract representation. You know, maybe some of that is, is in there. We, we cannot definitively say it's not, but um, given what we know about this brain area, we are confident that it is, you know, it's driven by the speech attempt itself. I see. And so you also mentioned that uh, your technology sort of predicts what the person is going to say next after uh, they say one or two words based on, you know, the English language and how it's said. So in your paper, you, I assume this is what's called like the autocorrect function. So could you maybe explain how the language models this sort of autocorrect function and how you were able to do that? Sure. So um, the way that this process works is the model is, or like I should say the, the, the pipeline, it's getting in, as I said, it's detecting attempts to speak. And then it's trying to classify those attempts to, like from brain activity to determine how likely each word was from the brain activity. And so each time that happens, the sentence is basically getting longer by a word. And so the, the pipeline, you know, this kind of language modeling component is keeping track actually, it's not just throwing away all that information, it's keeping track of these probability distributions. So it knows, what I mean by that is, it knows for the first word, maybe is was most likely, but it was second most likely. And for the second word, it knows, you know, this word was most likely, but this one was also pretty likely. And so this is how it's able to it uses this information to help make these corrections as it keeps going. Because maybe at one point when there's only two words, it says, um, you know, it's decoded how are, right? Or like how are as the first and second word. And then maybe it is really confident um, that the third word is I, Maybe the, the neural model says, oh, actually, I'm really, really sure that the third word is, is the word I. And so the model will go back and say, oh, for the second word, I was pretty confident it was R, but it might also be am. And so now maybe the autocorrect feature at the end will go from how are to how am I, if that makes sense. So all I'm trying to say is that the model can incorporate new information to update its previous predictions. And that is kind of what's thought of as this autocorrect uh, functionality. Right. And so in the process of, you know, adding to this database of 50 words that you have so that you can make it more uh, usable and um, of that sort, 
do you could you use uh, like artificial intelligence, for example, to begin to create more words to add to the database, or is that something that uh, you guys, as the scientists, will have to uh, add in yourselves? Well, I guess technically the the models that we are using, the speech detection and the um, word classification, are artificial intelligence models. So, and for your question, you're asking how more words could be added. I mean, I'd still think in, given the current constraints of our approach, we would have to collect data of the participant trying to say those words. Um, I don't know of any straightforward way right now to add more words just by artificial intelligence. I'm not saying there isn't a way for that, but that's just not the way that our approach has been set up. Right. And so talking a little bit uh, more big picture now about your project, do you think that, um, I understand that it's in a very early stage process, what with like 50 words only and um, all of that, but do you think that the technology you created will soon be accessible like to the general public and people who are paralyzed or um, is it not so? Because is the, is the process uh, pretty expensive or is it something that people can use more rare or more uh, regularly? Yeah, so it's really, really hard to predict how long this will take to kind of come to market, if you will. Um, it, these first results are very promising, but really the technology has to be validated in more than just this one person. That's kind of a major next step for us is like, we need to be sure that this can work in, in more than just our current participant. So we have to work with, our goal is to work with more people to, to make sure that our approach is generalizable. Um, and if that is the case, which we you know hope to see, then I think that the technology could be getting closer to something that that can actually be used to help people because that's even right now with fifty words, I know many might say that that's useless, but honestly, I have met and you know interacted with patients with severe disabilities who cannot even communicate 50 words easily. Um, and actually being able to reliably communicate with a, a 50 word set to make sentences um, would actually be like pretty transformative. So, I mean, this is not, so I would say like not for general purpose, but um, we do hope that through more work, if we are able to get to a larger data set, then um, we can definitely, or sorry, a larger word set. And I think this definitely becomes more viable for, for more people. Um, it's unclear how long that would take though. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And um, also I wanted to ask, is the process that your team used only available in English so far? And would it be very difficult to possibly add other languages so that a larger variety of people could use it? And if so, how would that be done? Yeah, so we really think that we're tapping into the, as I said, the part of the brain that controls the vocal track. And if that is true, then everything above that can be, you know, through artificial intelligence, machine learning, language modeling, these kinds of things you should be able to generalize to other languages um, because all you know, spoken languages require that there's some vocal track control. So right now the study, you know, it's only these 50 words and they're English words, but there's no, like the approach itself is applicable to other languages, especially in the simple sense of like, of having someone try to say individual words from a language and understanding those patterns. Um, so yeah, in short, right now it is only built for English, but we think that the method should be applicable to, to more than just English in the future. 
Right. And the thing is with different languages is that they always have like, you know, different ways of speaking, different, you know, patterns of words that people say more often than others. So would they have to like completely recode uh, what predictions can be made with each different language? Yeah, but the good news is that there's a wealth of research in kind of natural language processing. It's kind of a field of research that that gives rise to these language models, for example, similar to the one, or including the one we used in this work. So, and these exist for languages other than just English. So, you know, we don't have to recreate those statistics or like those models, those already exist, which is very nice because, um, you know, theoretically you could immediately use those in a different, in an application for a different language Right. And so now I wanted to also ask you, um, since you're probably going to take this project into uh, the future for quite a while, uh, if it was up to you, what were some next steps that your team uh, should take in order to build on your technology and neuroprosthesis as a whole, as you have it right now? Like, what ideas do you have that could potentially improve the process that you created? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, that's a key question. We definitely are really thrilled with the current results and with how promising, you know, everything was from this first attempt, but super interested in taking it further. And not just for us, you know, we hope other labs, now that they've seen that this is possible, because, you know, one of the key advances from the paper is that you can actually decode speech from the brain activity of someone who's been anarthric for over a decade. And so I think now that groups see this and understand that this is actually possible, we're hoping that there'll be more, you know, support generally throughout the field for this kind of new approach. But um, in terms of what we want to do, uh, I think, yeah, expanding vocabulary and testing in more than in more participants. Those are definitely the big ones. There are also some, I mean, there's alternative modes of like, you don't have to decode to just the word level. I described some other ways to, to decode speech that we've seen in people with intact speech. So, you know, decoding subword components decoding the actual speech waveform. Um, these are all things that I think are super interesting. And if we can kind of get closer to that, we might be able to get closer to large vocabulary, kind of continuous, more fluid speech decoding. And so I think those are like when I think towards the future, that's kind of the stuff I want to see. Right. And um, in the English language and pretty much most other languages as well, you know, new words and phrases are added uh, pretty regularly. So let's say we're at a point in this, uh, in this technology where you have most of the English language uh, in the system. Would you have to continuously add more words as you see like more vocabulary popping up here and there, or would it be able to sort of do it on its own? It's interesting. I mean, you could have it, you could have a model that's updated um, like a large scale language model that is kind of updated as needed. But um, it really depends on the approach, like the current approach, as we already discussed, would not work in such a situation because you need to actually collect samples of the person trying to say those words. But in the future, if there was an approach that was more generalizable, um, then Theoretically, you could just update the language model and then get, get the new additions to the vocabulary like available to the user. Right. And uh, I wanted to ask you now, taking into consideration everything that you've explained to me thus far in the interview, as well as everything you know about the project, 
how successful would you say your technique is for allowing paralyzed people to communicate with each other? Uh, like in terms of speed of detection, accuracy of words, things like that. And how much more successful do you think it can become? Yeah, so I mean, one thing is to emphasize, you know, this, the project is really about people with paralysis being able to communicate with people in their surroundings, not necessarily other people with paralysis. Um, but in terms of the current state, you know, again, I think for the, if this approach were to work in people with the most severe conditions, I think that would be a step forward. But again, it's, you know, it's 50 words. It's for, in our sentence decoding, we saw about 26% word error rate. That means roughly three out of every four words was correct. And it was about an average of like 15 words per minute. So it's still much slower than, than natural speech. Um, you know, most people, when they speak, it's around like 50, 150 or even higher words per minute. So yeah, I think there's a long way to go. And I mean, the goal is to, is to get to large vocabularies, you know, like thousand words or so that's when you really start to get an effective system for kind of like everyday daily use. Right. And so now I wanted to ask you as a conclusion to our interview, uh, I wanted to ask about the implications of the research conducted with neuroprosthesis by your team thus far. So do you believe that this new form of communication that you created will have a major effect on research into paralysis and the brain going forward in the future? And if so, how do you plan on using what you learned so far from your discovery in subsequent research or projects? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there are, I guess in short, you know, we really think that speech is one of the most fundamental forms of communication. You know, for almost everyone, it is the fastest, most efficient, um, most expressive form of communication. And this is why, you know, I say this because there have been previous kind of neuroprosthesis, uh, neuroprosthetic applications, previous brain computer interfaces that have enabled communication via things like um, imagined hand or arm movements. And so this is like a spelling, kind of like a spelling or a typing interface where intended messages are spelled out. And I mean, this so far has been really, really exciting, remarkable research. Um, there's some really cool demonstrations there, but for us, we think the ultimate goal is speech. And so I hope that with this work, other groups and, you know, just not only other research groups, but other people with paralysis can look towards this technology and say like, there may be something here. Like this, this has the potential actually to, to be at least another avenue of research into trying to develop a system to help people in, with this condition. So yeah, overall, I am optimistic about the future. I think that, you know, there's a lot more interest in these brain computer interface technologies. And so I'm hoping that, you know, soon in our lifetimes, we'll see, you know, real results um, that actually help people in their daily lives more than what's already been done. Yeah, there definitely seems to be a lot of potential for uh, what you've been working on so far. And I can definitely see that it's going to go very far into the future uh, and have a lot of additions to the project. So thank you, Dr. Moses, again, for appearing on the podcast. It was so much fun talking to you about neuroprosthesis and your work. And good luck with your future in neuroprosthesis and with your technology. Thank you, Sanjum. It's been it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it.